Thank you for what God is doing in your life. I'll I tell you what, God is doing some good stuff at LifeGate. Don't forget, uh, as you want to be a part of LifeGate, the, the Connect cards as well. And this little Connect card, all it is, basically, it's a little card that lets us know you who you are. And it get on the back, and you can check kind of what... I got this gift, I got this talent, I'd like to serve in this area. So everybody's getting connected because as we begin to connect on teams, as we're leadership training that we've had, and though some of you have yet to go through that, which you will, uh, as we begin to connect our leaders together, when we get over there, everybody will know what they're doing and going forward. Uh, as you know, it's, you know, we can get the leaders on the ground here. Everybody wants to be a part of the foundation of something. And so this is a great time and opportunity for those who are coming, being a part, joining up with LifeGate and being with Dr. Sandy and I uh, of, of, as we're bringing forth the vision and purpose for God. So, Kristen, love your voice, sweetheart. You're doing awesome. We love and bless you. Uh, the worship team is just getting bigger and better and better and better. Uh, I was showing them this morning. Uh, I gave uh, Justin a little copy of it, what I'd drawn out, that uh, our worship altar over there is 45 feet long, right? Wide, I should say, and uh, 14 feet deep. Uh, and so we can have, because uh, Josh's vision, I had to build for him too, you know, because his vision is to triple the worship team, right? And so, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be something when you have people sitting on the pews that is good as what they are on the stage. And that's, that's, that's all multiplication, that reproduction. You reproduce reproducers. And so that's all, that's what the body of Christ is about, isn't it right? And so that we begin to reproduce reproducers. So, so my heart is for you to use what you have. This is why this is a kingdom center. Okay? This LifeGate Church will be the working part of it. But here's a picture of the backside with all the, the foam on it and sanded. Uh, the scaffolding is up. And so... It's all part of growing and maturing the body of Christ and reproducing. But here's our building on the back side. This is actually a very back part. The phones where they're starting. They'll be doing stucco a latter part of this week. You'll see some windows probably going in in front. And he's going to move from the back actually to the front. So I said, I'm tired of looking at this. Look, it looks like a, it looks like a warehouse or something right now, you know. And so the inside, the walls are framed up, and the frame is now completed. Inside, we are now ready. The plumber's already actually been there. He's coming Monday to finish up. Uh, so you can see some white pipe back there in the back uh, that's sticking up. But anyway, that's the uh, uh, from going from the foyer into the sanctuary. Uh, so all that. Uh, by the way, all the insulation that you see that's stacked up in there is free. Woo. So we we have a connection in Dallas. Uh, actually, it's in Duncanville uh, Company. <clears throat> they run these big rolls of, of insulation, and they have cutoffs that people order. So these are all cutoffs, but they're actually uh, 50 foot rows of cutoff, and they're going to throw them away. And I say, hey, don't throw them away. We'll make use out of them somehow and save us. Uh, every time I go down there and get a load, we need about three more loads. Uh, and so I've got one. Uh, you, you can just barely see on the far left in the rows over there. You can see those, but there's several rows over there. Uh, we've already picked up about over $1,000 in insulation. Wow. And so. Uh, and which brings me to a point, this Tuesday night, men, if you're local or if you come, uh, all the lumber is going to be delivered Tuesday afternoon for the altar. Uh, and so it's going to be outside. So Tuesday night, we need you to bring your biceps and your muscles and, <laughs> and, uh, and strong backs. <clears throat> and so we can pick the lumber. It's not going to be a whole lot. If I have four or five guys show up or something, it'll take us maybe 30 minutes to get it all inside. We've got to bring it inside the building. <laughs> And so uh, we don't want uh, some things have been, uh, people have already borrowed some things from God. <laughs> and, and so uh, we want to, uh, we're going to claim a hundredfold return on everything that's taken. And so uh, we, we, have, we have the insurance, but at the same time, we, uh, we're going to put some cameras up too. And so we're going to just uh, catch uh, that guy that's borrowing this stuff. And so, uh, anyway, in, in God is so good. Dr. Sandy, Sandy sends her love to you guys, and she's actually healing very well from her uh, nose surgery that she has. Uh, she's excited that, that uh, it looks much better. She can breathe already much better. Uh, the black uh, and blue is now turning green, and it's almost all gone. So she said, I'll be there next Sunday. So, matter of fact, uh, next Sunday, uh, Josh is going to be preaching. And so... Uh, uh, it's going to be pretty awesome, so bring a friend, and so uh, as a minister of God, is, and he's a graduate of Christ for the Nations, and, and, and so most of the worship team up here is from that. So we, we love what God is doing at LifeGate, amen? 
Hey, Amen. Let me go ahead and gonna be dismiss the kids today. Okay, man, you're gonna be gone. You gotta give me a high five as you come by or something. Oh, all right, good guy. Way to go, guys. Go, go be blessed today in Jesus' name. Father, we speak life over our kids and teachers in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Woo, hallelujah. That's the new generation Z move right there. You know, that's a, <clears throat> love our kids. Love what Ellen and them are doing back there in the back. Uh, and by the way, we are, I'm, I'm here in the next uh, month or probably so, I'm going to be moving our McDonald playground out of my, my place to the building if we can get, get the concrete poured. So our kids, uh, for example, you didn't know, we have actually a McDonald playground that we had purchased for a good price. It's been stored in my storage building for a while. Uh, so we're going to get that over there as well and start maybe erecting that, man. Get ready. Ladies, you need to make some pies and burger sandwiches. All the <laughs> but all these guys are going to be over there working, so we're, we're going to have some things going on. Amen. Well, Father, we bless you today for your word. I ask your Father, that uh, you would use me for your greatness. Yeah. This is your hour, God, that you teach your children. So, Father, we ask that the, the Holy Spirit would use me. Let me have the scriptures. You said it that you could give me the scriptures that I need when I need them. So, Father, we thank you. We rely on you for your greatness, your power, and your might. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. So we thank you for your word that we lean heavily on. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I'm going to talk today. I'm going to kind of pick up on part two. Oh, you know, last week we talked about holding and possessing. Uh, there is a big difference there between holding and possessing uh, because uh, you know, as we begin to hold our ground versus possessing our ground, I mean, you know, it's, sometimes it's harder to hold on to what you've got mm -hmm. <clears throat> after God gives it to you and after you battle for a while. It's, sometimes it's harder for you to hold on because the enemy comes to do what? He comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. Is that right? And so, so last week we talked about that, about holding and possessing, but... I'm going to tag on to that this, this week about uh, receiving your inheritance because once you possess something, sometimes you don't have to possess it. Sometimes things are just given to you. Uh, and, and I'm going to be talking uh, two parallels here or, or side by side. One is the natural blessings or inheritance that we get. And then we'll be talking about the spiritual inheritances that we get. And sometimes you can see your inheritance, and sometimes you can't see your inheritance, but you just have to know by faith that it is there. So because we're talking about spiritual uh, things, we always involve spiritual warfare. And remember, we talked a little bit about that. Not that we have to get up in war every day. I don't believe you need to wear yourself out. Now, Daniel chapter 7, Scripture says, In the last days, <clears throat> the enemy will wear you out. And basically, the only way he can wear you out is if you throw yourself in the ring. The key is not getting a ring. Now, watch this now, because the battle has already been won for you. When he tries to pull you in the ring and you say, Jesus, go back to the cross because he accomplished everything for you. And he, when the enemy tries to trick you and draw you into this circle that, that you have to sweat and war. and There are times for warring. There are times for declaring. There are times for jumping and shouting and beating and, you know, use your hands to war, the Bible says. But there are also times you need to sit back and say, wait a minute, greater is he that's in me than he's in the world. We do not have to fight every day. We fight from the victory and not to the victory. You see? So, so when we talk about holding possessing, it also includes inheritances. So last week we kind of left off with this scripture in 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2 because Paul told us something here. He said, we don't want you to be soon shaken. <laughs> he doesn't want you all jittery and so concerned about something over here and we got to let go and let God. He said, don't be soon shaken. And he gave us four things here. He said, I don't want you to be shaken in your mind. I don't want you to be shaken in the spirit, by spirit. No, but that's a small s. That's not the Holy Spirit. I don't want you to be shaken by some spiritual activity going on around you. And I don't want you to be shaken by the word because in the word is, in the beginning was the word and the word is with God. He's talking about a word, a, a little w here, of people talking things that's not biblical, not scriptural, not theologically sound. Okay? And he, so Paul is telling us here, we don't want you to be soon shaken in the last days because as we receive our inheritances from the natural and God spiritually, 
we have to know that we're going to have to hold on to them. But if we are not mentally right or knowing who we are in God, we can't allow the, 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 the troubled of the spirit of the word. Or, and he said, even the letter. So what he's saying there is, I don't want you troubled in your mind. I don't want you to be thinking about things or somebody's thoughts or somebody's got a, had a vision or somebody had a dream or somebody had something and all of a sudden they're trying to make a doctrine out of something. He, Paul is saying, don't it, go back to the cross. Everything goes back to the cross. It's been accomplished. It's been completed. And so therefore we can move forward. But Paul said, don't be troubled, soon shaken. Because when we're shaken, we start making silly decisions, right? Because the enemy wants to put stress on you. He wants to put things on you. And so that you will start, he may get things and you may have inheritance from the spirit of the Lord or in the natural and you start accumulating things. And then you start, well, what am I going to do? Listen, I know people that had no money and I know people that got a lot of money. And the ones that don't have a whole lot, they're stressed out because they don't have what they can't have to get. I know people with a lot of money, they're stressed out because they got so much they don't know what to do with. In other words, they have, it's a battle to keep what you have. No, but God, Scripture says he'll never give us more than we can handle. But remember this. I'm teaching this because God has declared LifeGate as a millionaire zone. Amen. Amen. So if we're going to be in a millionaire zone... You got to be, learn to do more than just how to handle 500 bucks or $5,000 or $50,000 or $100,000. When Prophet Leon, Prophet Leon spoke me over me and began to prophesy stuff, he began to talk to me, and he's talking about not the first phase, not the second phase, but he's talking about the third phase. And I said, Lord, we ain't got the first one yet. And you're already speaking the third phase. See, what you don't know, what I know is the fact is that land will not hold a third phase. That means something bigger has got to come out of that. Or does it mean that we just did three things on the same period? I don't know, but you know what? We're going to let go, and we're going to let God. <clears throat> so as we begin to move, but Paul said, in order for you to handle this, you can't be shaken. You can't go by the world's way, because the world's way is to get you distracted from your very presence of God. So, so Paul says, this, don't be shaken in your mind. Don't get... Don't be shaken by somebody's spiritual act. Listen, when somebody begins to tell you something that's not true, it sounds like a truth. There's tons of, of, of people out there that has a truth, but Jesus didn't say, I am a way. He said, I am the way, the truth and life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. I know a lot of great people, good people. I've been in the marketplace ministry for 30, 40-something years. I'm here to tell you there's some good people out there. I went even to the subcontractor some years ago, and I said, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I know God. I said, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I know God. I know Jesus. Do you know Jesus? Well, I'm a good person. I do good things for good people. Listen, I love and bless you for doing good things, but there is only one way. Yeah. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So, so there is only one way, and Paul is telling us, all this. But when we talk about <clears throat> inheritances, we have to talk about increase. Actually, we need to talk about two things. We need to talk about increase. We also need to talk about spiritual authority. Because as inheritances come, that means increase is coming. When increase comes, it can make you mature real fast, wow. or you can lose everything real fast. Wow. So, so everybody say increase. increase. Say spiritual authority. spiritual authority. So as we talk about those two things, an inheritance is an increase. And so as we have to walk into this anointing, and we have to walk with what the possessions that God is having, it's not just holding on, we are possessing as we move forward in the things of God. Now, listen carefully, because I want you to know that as we bring forth inheritance can be spiritual or it can be something in natural. I'm going to require you to do something this morning called thinking. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Because as we begin to get inheritance, whether it be from the natural or the spiritual, 
it's going to bring you things or increase. As it brings you increase, such as it could be cars, it could be money, it could be houses, it could be anything, but also realize that inheritance can also bring you things like inheritance from your family, like bad, bad blood vessels. You can get stuff bad and good. So as we begin to see our inheritance, you can even get debt from inheritances. Okay, But you can also get blessed beyond measure. Amen? So generationally, we talk about blessings and curses. Can, and, but generationally, the blessings and curses can actually end because the whole thing was wiped out. All the whole family is wiped out. Let me explain. Because when... God was talking to Saul in, I think it's 1 Samuel 15, and he said, I want you to remember Agag and the Amalekites, they were fighting there, and God said, I want to wipe that tribe out. I want to stop everything. I want to wipe out everything. So everything that breathes, everything that walks, everything is a cow, a dog, pig, horse, it doesn't matter, woman, child, whatever. He said, I want you to wipe them all out. And, of course, you know Saul, what he did for the best of all, he says, uh, <laughs> We're going to keep Agag the king, the best. Oh, and by the way, we're going to keep the best sheep and the best donkeys and the best animals. We're going to keep the best. And that's not what God said. God is trying to destroy the bloodline. He's trying to close out that whole thing. But, he, but because of disobedience, this is why he goes on to say oh, disobedience is as witchcraft. So, so we see that disobedience is a very something that, that a lot of us have to deal with simply because we're getting increased, but we're not doing what God said to do with it. Okay. See, so increase does not come because we ignore the problem. Increase comes because we overcome the problem. And there's a big difference in that. So, <coughs> so increase comes, <coughs> excuse me, because we are ready for it. Think about that. <clears throat> because as we're ready for that, you have to say the increase is coming. But if you're ready for that, here again, it could blindside you. <clears throat> Some of you sitting here this morning has got inheritance before and it kind of went. It, but it happens. It comes because, but spiritual inheritance can do the same thing. You can be somebody you're thinking, well, I've got this kind of a spiritual authority. I can walk in this spiritual authority. And then all of a sudden, God really puts you in a place of authority. Amen. It's called suddenlies. Amen. <laughs> How many of us have ever had something passed down from our family, mom or your mom or your dad or your grandmom or somebody? Have you got something that's been passed down? It's called an, an, an inheritance. So, so Proverbs 13.22 says this. <clears throat> it says, A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. And the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. And I've had people say, well, you know, Pastor, that wealth is laid up for the just. I'm just waiting. <laughs> I'm just holding on. I am just holding I'm being just. I'm just holding on. And so they're thinking by sitting around doing nothing that it's going to happen, and that's not the way God works. Usually when we move, God moves. So we become mature and we gain maturity to hold our possessions simply because we have a test or we have a trial. Anybody ever had a trial? Oh, yeah. oh and I love the book of James. He said, count it all joy when it comes. I don't know about you, but I don't dance and scream and shout and yay. I should, <laughs> right? But I don't because it's a test. Most people skip school on test day. So while increase can come, of relationship, spiritual authority comes to us through a covenant acceptance. Everybody say covenant acceptance. Because we're going to go somewhere. I could, you know, we could say a lot of things. Like I, you can say, well, you know, I accept my covenant. I, I just speak it. Or you can actually enact it yourself and really start beginning to believe what you're saying. You say, but covenant comes with a commitment. It comes by acceptance. Everybody say acceptance. And it comes by obedience. So we see that as covenant, we have, we have a job to do. We have to walk. We just, this, you can't just, oh, I guess you can. You can just get saved and sing hallelujah and taste, oh, taste and see that he is good. And you can dance and you can do some stuff. But then you get into performance. You're not living the life that God has called you to live. 
It's one thing to be the Christian. It's another to be the Christian that you've become. That's a whole new responsibility. So as we begin to look at some things this morning, I want you to hold on, stay with me, because acceptance is so important. Say acceptance. acceptance. This is more of a teaching message than it is a preaching, shouting message. So it's going to require you to, if you're note takers, you're really going to love the end of this thing because it's really good. I'm taking you somewhere that give you source that you can stand on and stand solid on the Word of God and say, oh, that's why I pray. That's why I got the inheritance. That's why my kids are blessed. And so that's, why, that's, that's kind of where we're going. So, but we can just say, I accept But covenant comes from those three things. We talked about commitment, acceptance, and obedience because acceptance of ourself is so important because if you don't know who you are, somebody will always tell you who you are. (laughs) Has anybody ever told you that you're not going to make it? Well, those are negative words speaking to you. So we need people sometimes to give us an encouragement. Now, David encouraged himself in the Lord himself, and some of us have to do that. But some people can't do that. When they get down, they need somebody to come and pat them on the back and say, get up, you're going to make this thing. You can do this. You can go forward. You can overcome. You can run through a troop. You can leap through a wall. And they said, oh, don't be start talking that Bible language to me. Just give me encouragement. In other words, what they want is just a hug and say, you're going to be okay. It goes back to relationship encouraging them in the Lord. Acceptance is so big. You know, Moses needed somebody to tell him who he was. Moses, you're my deliverer. Uh, yeah, but God, you know I can't talk. I stutter, and I can't. Well, I'm going to send Aaron along with you. I'm, I'll make it happen. Get in, you mighty man of valor. Who, me? Are you serious? I'm the least of my clan. I cannot be anything. Get in. You are a military officer. I'm going to give you 300 men, and you're going to accomplish, and you're going to overtake 300,000 men, a 10% ratio. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to test them. I'm going to try them. I'm going to, some of them are going to leave. Some are going to walk off. Some are not going to even want you to be. And, and, and Gideon says, God, you don't get it. There's 300,000 Midianites on the other side of that hill, and you want to give me 300. I don't, I don't, I didn't pass math in high school, but I know this is not going to work, right? But God had to tell him who he was. Matter of fact, God himself had to tell John the Baptist who he was. He was standing in the middle of the Jordan River. Jesus walks down off the Judean hill and he said, behold, the son of the living God. And, And God says, this is my son who I am well pleased. We have sometimes, somebody has to tell us who we are because acceptance is huge. See, if our confidence level is not known within of who we are, people around you can pick up on the fact that you are very insecure. It doesn't take a rocket science. It doesn't take somebody really genius to pick up the fact is that you have a low self-image of yourself. See, one of the largest downfalls of people today is that they have such a low image of themselves. I'm still talking about acceptance. I'm talking about getting an inheritance to you. But if, if somebody, listen, the reason that the, the lotto is so, it happens in the world system and after, I think it's three years after they get what the millions that they get, they're broke. Because they don't know how to handle what they got. When success exceeds your mentality or your intelligence, there's always a downfall. See, we have to see that now, I'm not talking about being prideful here. I'm not talking about a person that's being confident in, within, in themselves because if our confidence level is not there, what happens is it's real low, and so the people that are working, they, won't, they will never look for another job. They will never try anything because if they, if I, what, well, what if I leave my job and what if I don't succeed? What if you do? See? But I don't want to leave my job because I know what I'm doing and I'm, this is easy. I got it all down. Over there, I have to learn something all new. See, you don't have the confidence in yourself to move from $10 an hour to $25 an hour because you have a low self-esteem of yourself and you'll always be stuck. Low self-esteem always results in lack. Wow. See, we have to know who we are, not just in the people, but in God. But if you become so complacent of what you're in and what you're doing, you're going to be stuck there forever. 
Well, I'm praying for more. You, well, you can pray all you want to, sweetheart, but if you're not going to move, see, you have to do something. Now, I'm not talking about being, being leaving your job and going somewhere, and what if I quit my job? If I quit my job, I can't get another. I'm talking about using wisdom and transference of wealth, which is called, I, I'm not going to quit my job because I'm looking for a new one. See, the wisdom is, I've had people come to me, but it's all over. I quit my job. God's got to give me a new one. No, he doesn't have to give you a new one. He probably wants you to go back and tell him, I'm sorry, I quit. I didn't mean to. He probably wants you to go back and, and, and apologize. See, but we need to look for bigger and better things. Let, let's talk about acceptance for a moment because acceptance becomes a huge value when we're speaking of receiving our inheritance because acceptance means it's a process of accepting, or it's a process of being acceptable. See? So people say, well, they don't like me. Well, listen, there's people that don't like anybody. Amen. Depending on the day, they, the, the attitude that they're work, walking in that day. You know, some people are just that way. Come on, we have to be real. We, we, won't, we don't talk about where the rubber meets the road today. We're talking about being real Christian or being who you are. Because as we begin to reconcile, in other words, means to we need to bring ourselves or oneself to an acceptance level. In other words, let me tell you as your pastor, you are worthy in the kingdom of God. Now, whether anybody thinks you're worthy or not is their problem, not your problem. The what you think is the most important thing in your life so that you know who you are. Well, if they start saying, well, you're just trying to be a Christian. You're trying to be like Jesus. You should say, thank you. You know, I'm not going to fall and go the route you go. This is why Paul said, don't be soon shaken. Don't be moved by mind and letter and thing." Paul was telling us that this is the very things that the tactics of the world system uses to get you off track, to get you following something other than Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's where our downfall starts. See, what happens is, is this, is that, is that we, we don't think our, uh, we're reconciled, that we don't have anything to offer, but yet in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, it says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Not some things. All things have become new. So when... The death, burial, and resurrection. When Jesus came into John and he buried him, in other words, baptismo is the, the Greek word there meaning baptism. That baptismo means to be totally immersed. Okay? So when Jesus went under the water, it's a type and shadow of death, burial, and whew, the resurrection. From old man passed away, new man come alive. Now, people will freeze you in your past. I remember when you had that Coors can in your hand. I remember you. Well, that was 40 years ago, 30, 20 years ago. Yeah, I received Christ since then. I have changed my life. You froze me in time. I'm sorry, but I am not that person anymore. Amen. See, you, you've got to know who you are. Regardless of what somebody else thinks about you, you are who you are. Because let me tell you this, rejection is huge, especially in the church. People get rejected because the pastor walks by me. He's on his way to do something. He's got some point. And the pastor didn't talk to me this morning. I'm leaving the church. <laughs> See, we've got to grow up. Amen. I'm talking about church. I'm talking, this is the greatest hour for the church today. I'm telling you, you are the last of the chosen. The last day's church, we're looking at you. Amen. If you don't like the person, you better begin to like them because you're going to spend eternity with that person. That's a long time. But rejection is huge. And it's not for a young person or an older person. It's the fact is that rejection doesn't look at your age. It just says, reject them. Get them to turn. Get them secluded. Let them. This is why I wrote the book, Regaining Vision. You want to know how I know? I made it real little, real small. Because you know what? People who lose vision don't want to read. You can read it in an hour or less. 
It's down to, to the earth stuff. The fact is, if you lose vision, the first lie the enemy wants you to do to stop you from getting your inheritance is seclude you, pull you away from the people that love you. And if you should miss one or two or three Sundays, you know, people say, well, I'm not going to go back there. They'll know I'm not going to. We know you're gone, but we want you to come back because we love you. And the enemy would sell right the opposite to you. He'll tell you that they don't love you over there. They don't want you over there. You secluded anyway. You might as well just go ahead and be on your own. See, because it's the banana that gets separated from the bunch that gets eaten. <laughs> so we're still talking about covenant inheritance here. To increase spiritually without maturity. Let me repeat that. To increase spiritually <clears throat> without the maturity winds up being close are somewhat like Jezebel tendencies. Because the Jezebel spirit will move in false humility, which is all about control and manipulation, and they think it's spiritual authority, but they're spiritual authority with no maturity. Because they think control and manipulation, I'm bigger than you, and their thought pattern is this. Now, you may not see it in them, but their thought pattern is that if I can get more people on my side, I win. Which blocks your inheritance. See, that's a spirit that moves in false humility, but it's very strong to you. Now, listen, I know some strong ladies in the church, and that doesn't mean they're Jezebel. Okay? That just means they want you to move. They want you to do something. You know, but, but just because you're strong in nature or character doesn't mean you're there. Now, I've seen strong and strong. Okay? But the scripture says in Proverbs 25, 14, it says, Whoso boasts himself of a false gift is like clouds and the wind without rain. Everybody been going through a storm and a lot of wind, thunder and lightning, whatever. No rain. Nothing. That's, he's liking that as, as a spirit. Proverbs 25, 28 says, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Of course, it also says, if you want friends, you need to show yourself friendly. But it also says a person with a broken heart or you offend somebody, they're harder to win than a, than a city. See, so, so the, Solomon in Proverbs here is talking about really some important stuff. Please understand that controlling and manipulating someone is not spiritual authority at all. Spiritual authority that comes from God, it comes with the fruits of the Spirit. It comes with love and long-suffering and gentleness and kindness and goodness and temperance. All the, it talks about the good things, that, and it's with love. Now, somebody knows how to correct somebody in love. That's a spiritual authority. So let me ask, how did Israel lose the inheritance that God gave them? See, God gave them cloud by day, fire by night. He gave them protection from the, the animals and that kind of stuff. Water came out of the rock when they were thirsty. He gave them food. The manna fell from heaven. When they got tired of that, he gave them quail. He gave them all kinds of stuff. And having no diseases on the journey, their clothes never wore out, their sandals never wore out. Everything was perfect. How did they lose their inheritance. Here's how. They forgot his presence. They forgot his presence. We don't need Moses to come down. We just build us our own. We can build a golden cow. We, we can build our own God. We don't need to hear from him. See, man cannot reduce God's greatness just to a church service. God cannot just reduce the greatness of God just in the gifts of the Spirit. God cannot, I mean, you cannot, a church cannot afford to push God to the side and say, wait a minute, I've got this and I can make this go. We can't afford to go there. We can't reduce the ministry of Christ to certain things because God's been too good. LifeGate, let me tell you, God has been good to LifeGate. 
It's been good to FCC Faith Christian Center. God launched this thing by a, a prayer and everything. But God just began to do things with Dr. Sandy and I out of nowhere. We're a marketplace minister. It's been a builder for years. And all of a sudden, I get this word. And all of a sudden, she is dying. And God gave her, I mean, the, the, the doctor gave her three months to live. And God steps in and says, you're not going to live. You're, gonna, you're not going to die. You're going to live. You're going to write books. You're going to travel the world. You're going to minister, minister thousands. You're going to do it. And, and then I'm sitting there thinking, what do we do? She's dying. If this word is true, listen, my fundamental background that I grew up for 25 years didn't believe what I'm preaching today. You've got to understand that, that God can break down every barrier, and when he is good to you, you've got to follow what he says. He is good. Listen, we took the prophetic word that was spoken over life. I'm not so sure at that particular time I even believed in prophets. Come on, I'm telling you in my heart this morning, I'm telling you that the Word of God came forth and I began to believe. And so I went down and they began to teach me about the prophetic gift and how God uses people and how He doesn't use people. And, and if there's prophets in the, in the book of Revelation, there must be in the prophets for the last day. And the, there's an apostle and the prophet laying in the streets of Jerusalem. So if they're, it's at the book of the Bible, I guess it's probably going to be there now, right? And so I began to look at all this. I'm thinking, wow, well, don't forget 1 Timothy 1.18. Well, I said, what does that say? That means if you take the Word Words, the prophetic word that's been spoken on you. Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, those prophetic words that's spoken on your life, you take those and you war with them. And by the way, we went to another step and said, write the words out because after you write them out, it becomes a decree. It comes more than just a spoken word over you. When you write it out, you learn some something. There could be one word that changes the whole meaning. We prophesy in past, present, and future. If you don't know about the gifts of the Spirit, you need to learn that. But I begin to war with it. Let me tell you a story that most of you hadn't heard and don't know. We were, tr we were in another church, on the board of another church, doing great, happy. I was a home builder for years. Love doing what I'm doing. And then all of a sudden, I get a word from Bill Hyman. Prophet, we call him bishop now, but him, he's the father of the prophetic move. He comes in and says, thus saith the Lord. You're going to minister to church. You're going to know how to build, and you know how the electric goes in, the, the plumbing goes in, the concrete goes in, and you know what goes in the house. You will not only build them in the natural, you're going to build them in the spiritual. And I'm saying, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And I went to bishop after he said that, and I said, I think you missed it. You don't tell somebody you met. That was me. I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm a home builder. I like doing what I'm doing. You, you know, and he said, no, you're going to build the house of God. I said, okay, I can do that. Man, I'm an architect background. I can do that. I can do that. No, no, no. He said, you're not going to physical, natural. You're going to build them in the spiritual. And I said, oh, wow. So months, months later, years go by, actually. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to start a church. And I said, oh. Really? I don't know how to start a church. I leave the house. We rent a little storefront over here on Pipeline. I go over, and I told Dr. Sandy, I said, I am not going to come home till I hear from God. God, now listen, this is a true story. This is from my heart. I'm going to share it with you because most people have never heard it. The fact that I went, I went to, I left home, and I said, I am not going to come home. It may be days. It may be hours. I don't know, but I'm not going to leave until God speaks to me. Angel shows up. I'm laying on the altar, head between, you know, down what we'll called second carpet. And I was wigging. I said, God, you don't need another church. You got 50 of them in one mile radius. I mean, we got, I mean, every street. I mean, there's probably 25 churches on one street. And I'm thinking, you don't need another one. What do you need another one for? And he's, well, I don't need them. I need you to start this one because you're going to teach, train, and activate the saints of God. My people need training. They got churches, but they need teaching and training. Angel shows up, speaks through things. He said, number one, I'm confirming the fact that you're going to be my pastor. I'm confirming the fact that you're going to be a church and confirming the fact that I'm going to be the provider. And I said, oh, Lord. So we go home, and I tell Dr. Sandy that, we, that we're going to start a church. And we're gonna, I saw an angel, and she goes, and she's mad. She is really ticked off. And we go, I'm, I'm seriously, because I had just built her a new, us a new house, and, and when she flushed the potty, the potty's overflowed. It was all over the house. And I'm seeing angels, and she's cleaning up messes all over the floor. The, but, the point, but the point being is that we did start the church, and, and it, we're, there in this, we're in this storefront for six years. And one day I'm driving down Bedford Road, and I circle underneath the overpass down here at Bedford Road, and I circle up, and I'm looking for land. I'm searching. I'm, I'm a minister now. 
Glory to God. And I'm, I'm looking for land, and we're growing, and we got 30-something-odd people, and I'm thinking, wow. And this, this couple over here moves in from all the way from North Carolina, comes in and says, we won't be a part of you guys. And I'm thinking, glory to God. We thought you got somebody moving them in. This is wonderful. <laughs> and, and some other stuff happened as along the way. But, but it, I'm driving, I'm driving underneath the overpad, look up, and this guy's out in the middle of this field over here, and he's putting up this sign that says, for sale, big sign, for sale. And I just playing a religious game, I put my hand to the side and I said, Lord, I believe I claim that property for my Jesus mighty name. Lord, I know it for somebody else, but it could be for us too in Jesus' name. And I pulled up on the service road, pulled up on the highway and this voice in the back seat of my car said, you can have it if you want it. I mean, it wasn't really a deep, you can have it if you want it. It was like, a normal person, I, I mean, it scared me so much, I pulled off the side of the road, and I was shaking, and I was afraid to look in the back seat, because somebody was there, and I looked, and, I, and, there, and there's nobody there, and I'm thinking, wow, is that what God sounds like? You know? And so I go up, go over Brown Trail, go back down the other side, come back around, and I go out and knock on this guy, knock on, on his window, he was in the car, and he said, how can I help you? And I said, is this land for sale? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, I'm going to present a contract. This is back in 19 and late 80s when the savings and loan was going upside down. People were bellying up. There was no money. The property sold for, you know, so much a square foot, not by the acre. And, and it was crazy. And it was worth like $600,000. And so I said, I'm going to write a contract on it. And it, and it was seventy thousand. I said, I'm gonna write seventy thousand dollar offer. And God, this is what you got to do. You got to give us the financial. We don't have any money. So Lord, we, we're gonna find seventy thousand dollars. We're gonna want you to have him, the homeowner, to carry the note. We're gonna finance it at ten percent down, and he's gonna carry the note for thirty years, and we're gonna pay the interest based on the thirty year amortization. Wow. And I told the guy, he just laughed at me. <laughs> but I know real estate because you, once you present a contract, they have to present the contract. So he presented it, and he laughed at me. And I called Gerald, and I said, Gerald, we ain't got no money. <laughs> and we needed $1,000 for, for, for down payment. So between us both, we came up with it, put the money down, wrote the contract, gave it to him, and he met me at McDonald's, the guy who with the property, the, the guy who was putting the first sale sign up. And he put the first sign up, and he said, he said Reverend, You know he's not going to accept this contract. And I said, hey, just if you'll just present it, that'd be great. And I'm talking about an inheritance spiritually. Hang on, what's this? So he takes the contract. He calls me in two hours. He said, Reverend, can you meet me back at McDonald's? I said, sure. I walked in, and he's, standing, he's sitting over here at this, this booth, and he's going. And I walk up, and I say, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. And he said, he said I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I said, what do you believe? He said, he took the offer. If I knew he was going to take the offer, I would have bought it. <laughs> and I said, he took the 70000 He said, he not only took the 70000 he took the 70, He's going to finance it for you. He's going to carry your note on a 30-year amortization. All you got to do is pay the interest yearly until you can close in and have a payoff in five years. I said, sounds like God to me. Yeah. Long story short, we build the church. And we started the foundation. We go through a bond program, start it. And what, you know, the word of God is still there. The inheritance that God spoke to me, the promise. Everybody say promises. Promise. The promises of God are yea and amen. amen. Foundation is poured. The lumber is there. And the, just the plate line of the building, interior walls, like we showed you earlier, in some, just the plate were down. And I'm walking around and I'm just, and off in the foundation, and I go back to where my office is going to be. And there's some boards laying, little cut lumber just laying on top of each other. And I'm just kicking around. And I, when I kicked it around, I saw a little envelope, a white envelope there. And I'm thinking, what would an envelope be doing at this stage of the game? So I reached down and picked it up. It's an envelope. It's a little kid's handwriting. And this, and this note says, here's my 27 cents. I know you're building the house of God. This is all I have, but I'm giving it to God. To me, I'll never forget that. 
because the word of God that said, I'll be the provider, was the same one that put that money in my office and said, from a little girl, unless you set me as a little child, right? That meant grew it up. I mean, growing up, we grew the church, whatever. And then Bishop comes and puts us on the road for 12 years. I'm flying in. That's phase one. Phase two, flying in from, from California. We're praying. <clears throat> After 12 years, <clears throat> excuse me, and the Lord says, I want you to plant another church. I said, oh, Lord. <laughs> Again. And he said, yeah, I want, you, I want you to plant one. And I said, but, Lord, we, we did what you said. And he said, yeah, but <clears throat> this is going to be different. This is going to be a watering hole. Mm. I said, oh, okay. Okay. How are we going to do that? And he said, I'll, I'll give, it, give you a plan. I'll just, just do what I ask you to do. So when we had left the church, we had like $30,000 left in the building fund. Well, when we left a year later, we bought this property, and it was worth $70,000. What did we pay for the first property? See, and I called this bishop, the Meridian Church. He said, we're going to have to have, how, what do you want for this property? I know, again, it sells by the square foot. And this bishop said, well, you know, if we sell that property, we're going to have, have to have at least $70,000 for it. And I said, Okay, so we wrote a contract, put thirty thousand down. That's all we had. Finance forty thousand, paying taxes on it for five years or four years, something like that. Five years. So then we we sell the property. We sell the property for three hundred thousand. Okay, but here's the key: the people put forty thousand down, which paid off our notes, which now we can actually finance the property that we own. So the monthly money is going to be coming to our ministry. So. We're the financee, or I guess. And then, then they pay us money for two years on a payment, and after two years they say, we don't want your property anymore. We're giving it back to you. Wow. So they paid us for two years, which actually helped Dr. Sandy and I on the road while we're doing it. I'm talking about the promises of God, blessing. His, I'm, I'm, come on, church, you're part of this. So I'm telling you our history, what we're foundation, what we're launching from. So, so we, we, we get the property. Three months after we get it back, after the three, they paid us for two years, three months after we get it back, they reappraise our property. It goes from $70,000 to $635,000. And so we can't pay taxes on $635,000. Yeah, but you're a nonprofit. You don't need to pay. But unless there's a building on the property, you've got to pay taxes. Checkmate. So God allowed us to do that. So we, we said, okay, that must be the church that God spoke about. Well, I guess we got the property. We're trying to sell it and give it away. And then God shifts everything and moves it around. And here we are. Now we're building the building what God said. Mm -hmm. See, I'm still talking about inheritance from God, how we are following God and what God is doing because, because this is our journey establishing the increase through what God is doing for LifeGate Church. From seventy thousand to six hundred thirty-five thousand dollars paid for. This is the equity. That's why we got a fifty percent loan on our building. And thank you who are giving to LifeGate for the building fund because that is covering, helping cover the interest. And, and some months it goes like this, some months it goes back up. But we, it's very important that we we you keep steady because we're paying interest. I mean, we're in here and over there now, and so we're we're moving really and doing really good. So so. Now let us move forward because when we think about our inheritance, let us not forget that a spiritual inheritance can be passed down from generation to generation. So, so LifeGate is a generational, it's a passion, it's, it's blessings and blessings and blessings. Listen, people are getting cars in LifeGate. Vicki just got a, a, a car that's got leather interior, it's an Acura, it's given, just given to her. She, she's not here today. Not, Vicki, we see you, and, and if you're watching, you're streaming live, but we bless you because, listen, that was a blessing. Pam and David got a huge breakthrough financially and, and didn't even know it was there suddenly, but so it is coming just being poured out. Our last church, I think it was seven cars given away in our last church. We're, listen, giving and blessing is what it's all about. But I want to show you several scriptures to, this afternoon or th this morning about how and what you can do that you can hold on to your promises. This will be important to parents knowing that your prayers, that you've spoken over your children. Now hear this, parents. 
when you pray for your kids, you're not just praying for your kids. When you pray for your kids, you have power and authority in the airways, and your prayers goes just like Isaiah said, my word goes to where I send it to, it prospers therein, and it shall not return unto me void. <clears throat> so you'll need paper and pencil if you're going to write this down because you, you can look back later and you can read it and get more out of it, but I'm going to give you some really some substance today. Listen, this, this, is, this is really important. Now, we're, we're going to launch here in 2 Samuel. David had just ushered the Ark of the Covenant in. Okay? It's not up there yet. Watch this. David, I'm leading up to this. Well, David is now, he is king. He's ushering in the Ark of the Covenant. He got, went and rounded up 30,000 men. Listen, 30,000 men is a city. Okay? 30,000 men, and they go to Gibeon and get the Ark of the Covenant, and they're bringing it in. So David had built this tabernacle, built this tent. And he's going to come and put the ark in it. Now, along the way, remember this ark, they stop off at Obadiah's house, and he's like three years or something, and he got blessed coming in. I mean, everything in his house turned to gold almost. It was incredible. Uh, that's where Uzziah grabbed, you know, put his hand on the ark of the covenant, and he died because it was tilting over. He touched not the anointed. So we, we, we see that, that some things happened there. They put it on a new cart with new oxen, and they brought the cart in. And, and as they're coming into the city <clears throat> from Abinadab's house, they bring in this ark in, and they're bringing it in, and David is dancing. I mean, he is shouting. They're playing on instruments, and they're, they're hoop line. They're be, they got tambourines, and they've got cymbals, and they've got psalteries, and they've got guitars, and they've got instruments made out of fur and wood, and they're dancing. They're shouting. They are celebrating the Ark of the Covenant. Church, they're celebrating God's anointing. So remember what was in the, uh, the, the ark there, the, the tablets of stone and the things like that. So there's three items in there. You can read that. For time's sake, we'll move on. But, but as they begin to bring it in, David is at rest now in 2 Samuel chapter 7. He's sitting here to the side, and he, he says he has some time to think. He's at rest, and he, he's sitting in his house, and he looks over to Nathan, the prophet, and he said, Nathan, I'm dwelling in a house of cedar. I got a nice house, but the Lord's house is in curtains. In other words, it was in the Holy of Holies. It said, it came to pass when the king sat in his house, David, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all of his enemies, that the king said to Nathan, which David said to Nathan the prophet, see now, I dwell in the house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth in within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with thee. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell David. Now, this is a word from God through Nathan to David. He said, Go tell David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in? He said, I want you to build me a house to dwell in. Let me just go to my Bible here. Well, what, what, what verse are you in here? Uh, Samuel 7, uh, 3. Okay, and he said, He shall build a house. Oh, hold on. I'm right curtain. Okay, and it came to pass in verse 4 that the word of the Lord came, and they said, Go and tell the servant David. Now go to verse 10. See, it says, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them. Everybody say, Plant them. Yeah. God said, I'm going to plant them, and they may dwell in the place of my own. Move no more, neither shall the children of the wickedness affect them any more as before time. Verse 11, and as since the time I pledged, I commanded judges to be over my people of Israel and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies. <clears throat> also, the Lord tells David that he will make thee a house. In other words, Nathan, be sure and tell David, I'm going to let him build a house. And when thy days be fulfilled, now this is very important, what the word of the promise of inheritance to David. He said, when thy word be fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. In other words, after you die, when you sleep with your father, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. In other words, he said, I'm going to establish my covenant with you, David. I'll always be with you, David. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Your generations, 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 your great, 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 great grandkids 
will be your seed. I'll never forget my covenant. Now watch this. He said, and I will, verse 14, I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chastise him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children. So he said, your children mess up. I'm still going to discipline them. I'm going to deal with them, David, but I want you to know that your seed is going to be incredible. But my mercy shall not depart from you, David, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. In other words, he said, I'm not going to treat you like Saul. I'm going to treat you like a son. And thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever. Everybody say forever. Say forever. forever. Say forever. forever. He said forever before thee. When God says, I'm going to do it forever, he really means forever. And he goes on, he says, that according to all these words and according to the vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. Go to, go to 1 Kings chapter 2. Look at verse 1. Now David, uh, the days of David drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon, his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thy strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, keep his statutes, and keep your integrity, keep the commitments, keep the commandments, and his judgments, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses. Now, watch it. David didn't tell him that just to be telling him something. He said, if you will stay connected to God, if you'll stay connected to the law, yeah. back in those days, the law and the commandments and do everything he said. In other words, my blessings will go right through you and on you and overtake you. This is David saying this. What's this now? He said, and to keep charge, in other words, keep the law stuff, that thou may prosper in all that you do, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. Go to 1 Kings chapter 8. Look at verse 1. We're still moving years ahead here. Now, this, remember it took, this is about 13 years later. It took them how many years to build the house? It took them seven years to build the house. Remember, David didn't get to build the house. His son Solomon got to build the house. Because David passed. But David's legacy and his promises, his inheritance and his prayers are still being fulfilled through his kids and his grandkids. He said, Then Solomon assembled the elders together in Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the children of the chief of the fathers, the children of Israel, unto the king of Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which was at Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled themselves to, to him. And it says here in... Verse 6, and the priest brought out the ark of the covenant of the Lord into his place in the oracle of the house to the, most of the, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubim. Remember the holy place back in David. God said, I will give you. You're telling me that my house is in dwelling in curtains, but I'm telling you my house will dwell in a house. See, David said, Lord, I'm going to build your house. His vision was still there. In verse 10, And it came to pass when the priest came out of the most holy place, when he brought it in, the cloud filled the house of the Lord, that the priest couldn't stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. That's what the tabernacle was like. First Kings chapter 11. Look at this. Now we're talking 53 years later after David is dead. He is gone. His kids, his grandkids are fulfilling the purposes of God. Don't you know that David prayed over his kids? Don't you know that David laid hands on his kids and said, you will succeed. You will, if you're a ditch digger, you're going to be the best ditch digger in the world. You'll, you'll be the, if you're going to be a secretary, you're going to be the head secretary. You're not going to be the second secretary. You're going to be the best of the best. David prayed over his kids. And parents, this is what we have to do with our kids. We tell our kids you will succeed you will be blessed coming in you will be going be blessed coming in 53 years later in first kings chapter 11 we see in verse 6 and solomon did evil in the sight of the lord and went not fully after the lord as he did as david his father did then did solomon build a high place and some other stuff and Molech and abomination where the children would pass through the fire and did evil in the sight of God. But look, watch God. Look what happens here in verse 9. And the Lord was angry with Solomon. Did the Lord say he's going to deal with him? He did. And he's going to. What's this? But he doesn't stop the commitment and the covenant of David. He said he was angry because his heart was turned from the Lord, the God of Israel, which he had appeared to, to him twice and had commanded 
him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, small g there, but he kept not that which was the Lord commanded. Remember, David said, stay with the commandment. Stay with the commandment. Let the fulfillment. I'm telling you, God will bless you if you'll stay with me. Don't run off and do silly things. Stay. Don't be troubled in mind, letter, word, spirit. Hold steady with the word of God, and God will bless you and your kids and your family and your generations to come. Look what he says in verse 11. And wherefore, uh, let's go back to verse 10. And he commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. Verse 11, wherefore the Lord said to Solomon, for as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant, and you have not kept my statutes, which I commanded you to do, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and I'll give it to your servant. I'm, I'm going to take it from you, and I'll give it to somebody else because you've been unfaithful. But, <laughs> verse 12, nevertheless, notwithstanding in the days, I will not do it, for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of your son. I'll take it away there. What's this now? Now go to 1 Kings chapter 15. Now in the 18th year, now this is not 53 years, this is 86 years later. 86 years later after David is gone. Now the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Verse 2, three years reigned he from Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Micaiah, the daughter of Absalom. Abishalom. And he walked into all the sins of his father. Your kids are not going to be perfect. But because we pray over our kids, because we have a covenant with God, because we're standing strong and, and get our kids to line up the best of our ability. Listen, we have all sinned and come short of the glory. Our kids are going to make mistakes just like you and I have made mistakes. We have to line up to this thing. But the word here says, and he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. In other words, before Solomon. Now, this is Solomon's kid. This is David's great gang kid, his great kid. And he says this, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God and his heart of David like David's was. Nevertheless, in verse 4, nevertheless. Everybody say nevertheless. nevertheless. I love this. Because nevertheless, for David's sake, did the Lord his God give him a lamp in Jerusalem to set his son after him and to establish Jerusalem because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Listen, we find now, 83, we find 156 years later that David's prayers of his covenant promises and seed is still moving forward. Go to uh, 2 Kings chapter 8, look at verse 16. Can you see the covenant faithfulness of our God here? Can you see things moving forward? And in the fifth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, the king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, being the king of Judah, verse 17, 30 and two years old he was when he began to reign and reigned for eight years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel and did the, as did the house of Ahab. For the daughter of Ahab was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 19, everybody say, yet. Yet. yet and the Lord would not destroy Judah for David, his servant's sake, as he promised him to give him away, always a light and unto his children. Go to 2 Kings chapter 19. Look at this. This is pretty incredible. In verse 35, now we're talking 313 years after King David has dead. His blessing, his promise, his covenant with God is still going on with his great, great grandkids. And he says this, and it came to pass, verse 35, that night that an angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians in hundred four score. In other words, 185,000 soldiers. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, departed and returned and dwelt with Nineveh. Why did he leave? Let me tell you why he left. He couldn't win. He could not win because you can't defeat a dead person. Come on, David's promises is there. David's kids are there. David's grandkids, great-grandkids, great-grandkids, great-grandkids. It's all still there, still believing in war. They did things wrong, and the Bible says they did evil in the sight of their God, but because of David. See, because of his faithfulness. This is why we need to pray over our kids. 
This is why we need to do. See, King David knew this. Wow. From 313 years later, it's not going to stop at 313 years. If he did it for 313 years, it's not going to come to an end. Why? Because David died 300-something years ago, but the fact is his voice, his covenant, his promise with God is still echoing in the heavens saying, God, you said. See, our kids may mess up. If your kids mess up, you can say, get them, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Straighten them up, God. They still got a destiny. They still got a purpose in front of them. I'm still holding. I'm still believing. I'm doing what you said to do. God, if you did it for David, you'll do it for me. My God, my God. David's prayer was effective. Even when we're parents, we're praying over our kids. And even the younger generation doesn't have kids yet, but you will. I'm telling you, lay your hands on your kids. They're asleep or awake. Doesn't make any difference. The prayer is effective. You tell them, Father, I thank you for this daughter. I thank you for my son. Listen, I don't care if they're one years old or 50. You're still dad. You're still mom. You're still granddad. You're still grandmom. You still carry a weight. You carry authority. You say, Lord, they will succeed. They will be blessed. Out of the genealogy of David, Jesus would be born. He had to keep the the purification going. He had to keep the righteousness going. Somebody had to walk in the right. Josiah. David's great, 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 great. I don't know how long. Eight years old. Takes ruler of the kingship. And Josiah standing, eight years old, standing on the temple steps. And the priests and everybody's coming out to Josiah and said, Hey, young man, what are you going to do? This is what Josiah said. Josiah said, I don't know. Go get the scrolls. Bring the scrolls out here. We'll read the scrolls and we'll see what God is going to do. See, the descendants of David is still going on. Stand with me this morning. The greatness of our God. See, God, listen, we may never know. We may never, ever know the effectiveness of our prayers. We might ever, not, might never realize because we're riding in a car, headed to work, praying for our wife, praying for our husband, praying for our kids, praying for our grandkids, you'll never know how effective that prayer was until you get to heaven. The power of prayer. I'm telling you, it works. The power. David, I don't think David even realized what is going to happen just because he was a warrior and he prayed and he declared, he decreed. While everybody else was doing something, David was attending the sheep, sitting under the little juniper tree, praising God, giving God glory, giving God praise. Did David mess up? Yes. Had a spiritual, a sexual affair? Yeah, he did. But God still used him because he was a man after God's own heart. Quick to repent. Apostle Paul, the worst terrorist that ever came out of Turkey, took him and shifted him, blinded him, healed him, fed him, ministered to him. Paul wrote 14 books. If you believe he wrote the book of Hebrews 13, if you don't, but theologically we really think that he wrote the book of Hebrews too. See, somebody prayed for you. Oh, I know we made fun of Grandma. I know we made fun of them and pulling out their Bible and rocking in the rocking chair. But you know what? Your name was at the top of the list. But you will succeed. You will succeed. Your kids will be successful. Are they going to mess up? Yeah, God said, I'll deal with them. I'll deal with them. But I'm not going to deal with them the way I dealt with Saul. Why? Because God was, Saul wasn't God's chosen. David was chosen by the Lord. Let me tell you this morning, you've been chosen. 
by the Lord. You have been chosen from God. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Father, I thank you. You're so awesome for watching over us, protecting us, protecting our kids, protecting our grandkids, our great-grandkids. Lord, sometimes we don't even know what we're walking into until we're there. But Lord, we also know that you're just and you're honorable and you're trustworthy. Lord, sometimes you bless us and we don't even need to be blessed. We're as filthy rags before you. But God, you said you gave your only begotten son and we believe that. And we confess Jesus with our mouth and we believe in our heart that we are born again. We're saved. Because of that, we become righteousness sons and daughters of God. All because of the blood of the Lamb. Not because we're good. Not because we think we're good. Not because we read a few scriptures and memorize a few scriptures. We're blessed and covered by the blood of the Lamb because God says, I've got you. I've checkmated you. Some of you got children that's running from God. I'm going to tell you right now that they won't run too long. They'll fulfill their little duty, what they think they have to do, but God will pull them back. Bring up a child in the ways of the Lord. The Bible said they will not depart from you too far. Well, just because they're sinning and doing their thing, they know God. They just hope they don't get caught at that moment. But we also know as parents, God goes into bar rooms. God goes into dance halls. God goes into drug wars. He goes everywhere. You can't, you can't hide yourself from God. He's in Jesus dealt with the sinner. He's a good God. I'd like for prayer team to come on down. I'd like Josh if you sing us a song. But this is what I... I feel like the Holy Spirit said to do with prayer. Some of us got kids that are doing, they're good, they're doing the right things, they're following the ways of the Lord, following doing certain things, but some kids are not. Remember, you were a kid once. We did silly things too. Biblical says it like this, he who has not sinned, let him cast the first stone. Romans 3, Paul said, all have come short of the glory. But this scripture and this teaching was not about falling short. This scripture and this teaching was about overcoming. Receiving the promise. Even though when we fail, the promises of God are still there. He says he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. So the Holy Spirit said, just pray. Just pray for our kids. Pray for your parents. I know parents that's running wild like the kids, and the kids are having to pray for the parents. Come on, so I'm not picking. God's not picking on anybody today. He's picking on all of us and saying, you know what? I got this thing. If you'll trust me, if you'll lean not to your own understanding, love the song, lean on me. When I'm not strong, I'll be your friend. That's what we need to do. The Song of Solomon's, remember they came out of the wilderness leaning on the beloved. Sometimes when we think we have this, we don't have it at all. We've got to lean on God. Say, God, I know our daughter used to come home. And Dr. Sandy would say, you didn't go where you were supposed to go. She said, well, how do you know that? Because the Holy Spirit knew. You got kids doing things, and you got parents doing things they shouldn't be doing. But I'm telling you, the covenant promises of God. The old, old song was he's got the whole world in his hand. Today's song would probably be Draw Me Close to You. 
never let me go. So, Father, I thank you for every parent, every child, every teenager. They're in this room. Lord, you see where they've been, where they're going, and what they're going to be. Lord, I pray for hedge of protection around every one of them from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. Lord, it's time for the church to stand up and line up with biblical principles of the church. Lord, LifeGate will never ride motorcycles down the aisle for attention. Our attention will always be on you. Thank you, Father, that we can stand strong loving you. We won't compromise your word, but we will stand and do what you call us to do. So, Father, I want you to touch every heart, touch every family this morning, whether here or not here. Your mom, I'm not present. God, you can be here in every place in the world at the same time. So, Holy Spirit, we love you. We thank you for your greatness, for touching hearts this morning. In Jesus' name. If you need prayer for your kids or you need... Thank you so much for joining us today on this Facebook Live video. Most Sundays, we have altar call, which is personal. And for that reason, we do not air this part of the service. We hope you understand and that you enjoyed the message. If you have any questions or concerns or if you have any revelation from the word today and you'd like to share it, or any testimonies for that matter as well, please reach us as on social media and those links will be following. Thank you so much and have a blessed day.